morning, everybody. Thank you for attending the Place Your Trades Network Spaces. This Spaces is brought to you by TraderVate, which has a custom web app dedicated to trading CMA Group's new daily option contracts, including indices, energy, metals, and now Bitcoin. You can also trade these on the DOM on TraderVate's main platform as well. They're a great way to get exposure to the futures markets with limited risk. Go to placeyourtrades.com and get the TraderVate app for free. I also write a weekly blog and daily pre markets overview on the markets that you can subscribe to at placeyourtrades.com. I will be doing a summary of this episode with my key takeaways that'll be available to download as a PDF. So if you're interested in uh, getting this PDF, I, uh, please click on the link in my feed or visit placeyourtrades.com backslash spaces to sign up for it. I'll also put it in the nest and the PDF will be available and emailed out to anybody that signs up. Just as a reminder, this material is presented solely for informational and entertainment purposes, and it's not to be construed as a recommendation, solicitation, or offer to buy, sell, long or short, any securities, commodities, or related financial instruments. Please contact a licensed professional before making any investment or trading decisions. And now on to our guest. And we lost my <laughs> Now on to our guests, we have Tim Price, who is Director of Price Value Partners. Tim is a graduate of Christ Church Oxford University, where he studied English. He has 30 plus years in capital markets, 15 years as a discretionary multi-asset portfolio manager and chief investment officer at three successive firms, Henry Ansbacher, Union Bancaire Privé, my French is wonderful, uh, PFP Group, and now of course, Director of Price Value Partners, who has shortlisted five consecutive years in the UK asset, Private Asset Managers Program, winner in 2005 in the category of Defensive Investing, a columnist, columnist for Money Week magazine and author of two books, one, The War on Cash, and the second, Investing Through the Looking Glass. Next, we have Michael Nicolaitis, Michael possesses a profound acumen in financial affairs, boasting over two decades of experience in capital markets. He serves as the founder and chief executive officer of DeFi Investors, an independent investment advisory entity specializing in macroeconomic and digital asset consultations. Currently, Michael holds positions on investment committees of two family offices, one major corporation where he contributes to their M&A strategies. Furthermore, he's an esteemed member of the Hellenic Business Angels Network. Before his endeavors, before his current endeavors, Michael was co-founder and chief investment officer at Apple Tree Capital, an independent CFA regulated investment firm in London, renowned for its global macro and emerging market investments. Last but not least, we have uh, government cheese. Gov is scoring by an alias, obviously, today, but... <laughs> Gov started working in retail portfolio management in 1993 with a bank-owned brokerage firm. He moved to a small boutique in 2001. It's called every major recession and bubble that's happened in his career, starting with the 1998 Asian flu, dot-com, subprime, and COVID lockdown. He's quite conservative in his approach and has been a, and is a big fan of bonds. He's built and maintained solid economic models that help him figure out where we are in the economic cycle and his been tracking and warning about the current economic slowdown for a year. And with that, I just reset your invite, Michael. Hopefully you got it. And with that, we'll go ahead. How we do this is since I haven't had you three in uh, the spaces before, we go in a round so nobody's sitting quietly for too long. So we'll have two rounds of questions each and then a final, uh, final thoughts round uh, at the very end. Um, so finally, to step her, we have, uh, Tim, we'll start with Tim. So Tim, you recently wrote a piece called Power Crisis, where you asked the question, are people living in denial about the severity of the oil challenge facing the global economy? So can you talk about this piece a bit, your thoughts on where we are at within this sector? Um, and I will also put a link on Twitter to this piece while we're talking. Sure. Can you uh, hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. 
Uh, well, that's uh, that's fantastic. To this is my first time, so please be gentle with me. Um, I suppose the thing that for me is most intriguing about the nature of the markets it derives back from a, a guy called Albert Bartlett, who's a uh, uh, sadly uh, deceased. I think he was a professor in physics at the University of Colorado in Boulder. But I first came across him via, I think, Chris Martinson's um, work back in the late 90s. And Albert Bartlett was someone who, 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 who said basically that humanity's biggest failing is our inability to understand the power of the exponential function. That is to say, the power of things compounding at a steady state of interest over time. Now, he, he wrote and he presented specifically in the context of energy i.e. You know, finite oil, finite fossil fuel supplies. But I think that you can also um, relate what he was talking about in, in terms of, say, the, the, the bond market. Because my background in, was in the fixed income markets before I moved into private client portfolio management. So I think the, the essence of really everything in, in the world of finance right now comes back to the world of debt because I think we're at the end of a, a debt super cycle. We're already over the cliff of that super cycle. So some form of financial and monetary reset is now not just likely, but probably inevitable. Central banks would like that to be central bank digital currencies, almost certainly. And nobody other than central banks wants to have anything to do with this nonsense. So there's all kinds of things to play for now. All kinds of things are on the table. Um, and the, to, to boil it down to the essence, the question we would ask all of our investors and everybody who's an investor uh, would be, you have a binary choice now. You can either put your faith in paper, you can put your faith in fiat currency, in politicians promises, which are ultimately worthless, which have shown how worthless they are over the last few years, or you can put your faith in the tangible, the real, the valuable things that are claims on the productive economy. And that would include front and center things like for us, that would include precious metals. It would include commodities. It would clearly include energy. Um, we particularly like the work of Doomberg on Substack in relation to the, the absolute nonsense that is the, the green energy myth. Um, and as a result, there's all kinds of things flying around now, but I think in the next few years, all kinds of fortunes will be both made and lost by people who, who miss asset allocate correctly. And what, so how is your sector exposure currently weighted, if you can talk about it? Sure. That. So in, in, a, in a very generic sense, because our, our client portfolios are, are bespoke, so they're, they're completely um, you know, tailorable. But in essence, if we were to run one, just one standard model, it would very roughly look that the three assets that we typically allocate to now, they would include what we call, let's say, value equity. So defensive equity, which would be maybe 30-ish percent of a client portfolio. It would include what we call uncorrelated assets, which is specifically systematic trend following funds, so a type of momentum strategy. You guys in the States would call these CTAs or commodity trading advisor type funds, uh, basically price momentum type strategies. That would be another maybe 25 to 30%. And then anything from 40% up allocated to what we would call real assets that would include things like gold and silver, the monetary metals for very specific reasons we can, we can probably touch on later but also to commodities more generally and to commodities related companies. And the reason we like a, a, a fairly punchy, some might say allocation to commodities is because on our analysis, the commodities, the listed commodities sector, that is the, the, the stocks of listed businesses operate in the commodities sector, industrial miners, for example, have never been this cheap relative to the rest of the stock market in our lifetime. So there is a huge opportunity for people who are willing to take the road less traveled. And since you did bring up gold, I had that on my list of questions for you because you talked a lot about gold in the past. So um, can you kind of give us your thoughts on gold and your in investment thesis regarding gold? Um, and, you know, are we headed towards hyperinflation? Well, I touched on bonds earlier, so again, because that probably reflects a sort of rather sad, nerdish background that I have in the fixed income market because that was my first job when I came into the city into the square mile in London uh, back in the 1990s. But in essence, the argument we would make, uh, which I think is increasingly indisputable, is that we're at the end of a debt super cycle that's been going for not just for 40 years in relation, say, to recent history, but it's actually, in terms of interest rates, it's been going for something like 5,000 years. So there's a, a huge super cycle that's now in the process of turning up. That is the interest rate cycle, in other words, that all problems derive back to the world of debt. 
if you accept the argument that there is simply too much debt in the world, primarily but not exclusively government debt, then you really have to also accept the, fo the following three, the only three options that are now available to policymakers. One is that governments of the West, it's primarily a Western phenomenon, um, engineer enough economic growth to keep that debt serviced. We would humbly submit that that's now impossible because the debt burden is simply too high. The second option is what one might call default, or if you prefer a slightly more polite version, you'd call it a restructuring um, or some form of re reintegration of the debt of the debt world. But basically, anything that remotely touches on anything close to default would be a renegotiation of debt would be basically catastroph catastrophic for the banking and fund and uh, pension fund industries. That would be Armageddon because we live in a credit based system. So what's in box number three? What's in box number three happens to be the box to which all heavily indebted governments throughout all of history have resorted when they get head over heels in debt, and that box is called inflation. So there's a gentleman by the name of Ludwig von Mises, who is one of the forefathers of the so-called Austrian or classical economic school, so someone who had firsthand experience of the Weimar hyperinflation in, in his case, Austria in the 1920s, and of course in Germany as well. And basically, Mises said that uh, inflation is not something that appears out of thin air like an act of God or like the plague. Inflation is a policy. In other words, what is happening in the world right now is not happening by accident. It is happening as a result of explicit state-sanctioned inflationism because inflationism is the only thing that can possibly attempt to resolve this you know, debt predicament that the West has found itself in. So... Uh, let's just say we expect inflation to be much higher for much longer than probably is the consensus right now. Excellent. Thank you. And we will definitely come back to you. I want to go move over to Michael. Let's talk a little bit about China right now. Obviously, everybody's looking at their economy right now for some clue on global markets. Yet FDI just turned negative. So are they in trouble? And what does this mean for global markets and commodities in particular? And he just dropped. Uh, let's see. Uh, approve. All right. He dropped. All right. All right. Did you? I send your approval. Michael, hopefully. Hello. Yeah, all Hello. Right. Hi. Did you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> Did you hear me? Hello, everyone. I heard the question. Sorry, there's a problem, I guess, with uh, with a line being cut off. I apologize for that. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me today. Um, before answering the the China question, I would can I follow up on Tim's uh, discussion, if this is possible? I, 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 Absolutely. I, I agree that uh, governments uh, will tick box number three. However, uh, box number three, it depends what kind of inflation you have. If, sub if inflation is supply driven, then the policies that the governments are taking right now are not very helpful. If it's demand driven, then it's helpful. The question here is, um, how are the policies going to affect everything? And I think the answer to all the questions and to China and to whatever we're going to discuss has to do with liquidity and most of, most mostly dollar liquidity. And given what the U.S. has been doing the last 18 months, raising rates, starting with tightening, and which are both uh, absorbing dollar hit, and now you have, the U.S. is having a huge fiscal. You're cutting out a little bit. Can you hear me? Yeah, Hello? I can hear you now. You're just cutting out there yeah, for sorry. a little bit. So I'm, I was saying that, uh, give it. Oh, you're still cutting out. The U.S. government. Maybe. Via... Can you hear me? You're still kind of cutting out a little bit. I might have to drop you down and pull you back up. Okay. He's gone. All right. So while we're waiting for him to reconnect, sorry, guys. Um, let's go over to Gub and we'll come back to Michael as soon as uh, he gets back on. So first, let's see. Um, so what? Let's start right in with bonds because I know you're the uh, bond guy, 
Um, so what are your thoughts on the U.S. bond market and um, the yield curve inversion? I mean, it's been inverted for probably the longest in history, and if not the longest, one of the longest in history, um, yet we still haven't had a recession. So is it this time it's different or is a recession at, at unavoidable? Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, as uh, Kim said, I, uh, it's my first time on, so go easy on me as well. But uh, yeah, certainly the the bond market right now is is just flashing a signal. And these signals have variable lags, and there's not much that you can do about it. You just have to wait uh, because the, the recession process is, it's a process. It's not a single event. And so uh, all of the models uh, really that, that you maintain uh, are flagging that there are some major problems. Uh, so this, this idea of, you know, a soft landing or no landing uh, and, uh, and uh, a possible way to avoid a recession is mostly based just on uh, the level of the stock market and what's going on there. And that gets people confused and draws them away. And that's why recessions are so painful because it, it provides a little bit of a head fake. We had this in, uh, for dot com. We had it in subprime. We had it in 2019 before the COVID crisis. So, um, I continue to think that, that we are on the cusp. I think that the recession is already here. Um, the only thing that people are waiting for now are the, the job losses, but we're starting to see that. Um, bond yields are starting to come down, and uh, I think that we will continue to see more and more as the news uh, comes out. And then it's then we just have to wait. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I've been de-risking slowly uh, over the last year. I always tend to be early on these things, um, but rarely wrong. And uh, so just continuing to chunk along and and uh, de-risk. And so there seems to be there seems to be three camps on inflation. You have the deflationistas, the inflationistas, and the stagflationistas. So where do you think we are right now? PM the Fed bring its inflation target down to two percent, as they have adamantly said that they were going to, or are they going to have to accept a higher rate? And I guess you could say the same same for Canada. Yeah, so the inflation thing is interesting. I, I think that's the the policy response that they had during COVID was so huge, um, and it's it's the, the analogy that I give to clients is that you dumped a whole bunch of gasoline into a into a barrel, and so the original uh, response created an astronomical amount of heat, which uh, for the first time ever, apart from QE, uh, this money was deposited directly into the economy. So of course you're going to get. Uh, the inflationary pulse there. Um, you had supply side uh, uh, disruptions as well, which was also creating a bit of a problem. But all of that kinetic heat, uh, all of the source of that heat, of the, that inflation is gone. And uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, Dr. Lacey Hunt's uh, ODL uh, compared to um, uh, CPI. And that has, has gone down negative even on a three-year average now. So I think that you're going to start to see things roll over. It has has persisted uh, for a little bit longer than I uh, thought, but I think that we're we're going in the right direction, and you're going to start to see prices come down. I for this is just my opinion, but I, I it's hard for me to imagine persistent inflation um, because it is absolutely crushing the consumer. You've got you know 140 million Americans and are just getting absolutely ripped to shreds with high prices on everything, falling income. I don't see how that kind of inflation is sustainable. So like you, you've basically taken all the oxygen out of the room. Um, so I, I just, for, for, from my seat, I can't see how that, uh, that inflation is sustainable relative to something like the seventies where you had high inflation, um, but you also had job growth, you had wages growth, you had everything that was sort of helping you at least keep pace with, uh, with prices. And we don't have that situation now. So I think we've got a bit of an air pocket. And at some point in time, I think we're going to get an economic sinkhole that just opens up and we'll start to see the real nature of the economy. And then, um, you know, we've heard from uh, Moody's recently that banks are sitting on a mountain of unrealized losses and U.S. banks could be grappling with $650 billion of unrealized losses in their securities portfolio. So how big of a problem is this or is it not going to be a problem? 
I think that's more a function of, of timing. I think if, if the Fed responds and drops, uh, drops rates uh, in response to some sort of emergency, which is typically what they do, they'll, they'll hike until they break something and then they'll freak out and have their come to Jesus moment. So um, that may skate a lot of these losses on side. Um, if they don't do that, it's just going to continue to break. I, you know, like I'm a big fan of analogies and I, I you know, I think that this is sort of the game of Jenga where we've been removing blocks for 18 months uh, to the foundation of the economy. And we're, we're down to the last couple of moves and we don't know when it's going to go, but it, can it go? And uh, there is an astronomical amount of debt out there and that needs to be dealt with. And uh, honestly, I, I think that a lot of it, and you're already starting to see it. You're seeing defaults, you're seeing closures, you're seeing stuff like that, but the market hasn't really cottoned on that this is a, a bigger, a bigger trend. Um, so I, I, you know, we, we seem to be keen to just try and avoid a recession at any cost and, and recessions are valuable and that they can clear the decks and re reset prices and, uh, readjust attitudes towards risk and, and just make everybody, uh, operate a little bit more, um, efficiently. And, uh, we've been interrupting that process for decades now. And, uh, this as, as both other presenters have said. This is a big problem that's been building for a long time. And I think we're getting close to the end of it. And uh, so that's, that's kind of my view on it. Excellent. Thank you. And while we're still waiting for Michael, he's still having technical difficulties. We'll go back to Tim. I, what are your thoughts on this endless bid in tech stocks with rising rates? One would think that would not be the case. Um, I think as Gubbs just said, we're, we're close to the end game now. Um, and I'd, I'd argue we're probably already there. So the current market environment to me feels a lot like the market environment of early 2000 at the tail end of the first dot-com bubble, when basically the, 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 the big tech sector, the big tech stocks, then the likes of Amazon and Yahoo and, and you know, the big tech names of that time, Oracle probably would have been one of them, um, were over the cliff edge, but they didn't, people didn't realize that until after the fact. So. The analysis we've done is that the, the, the likes of the so-called fangs, the likes of Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, et cetera, or whatever they're calling themselves these days, their revenues aren't actually, in most cases, they aren't actually any higher now, and in some cases, demonstrably lower than they've been over the last two years. So there's a kind of echo, echo boom going on, like a memory of the, of, of, of genuine bubble conditions, but it's not validated by anything. Um, so the uh, one analogy I'd make is it's a bit like the ship has gone down, but we, we haven't yet seen any of the, of the bodies float up to the surface yet. So it's unclear exactly what the state of play is, but I'd say that's indicative of the broader market to the extent that we've got a Potemkin market now, and we've got a Potemkin market. That is to say, a, a market that is, is, is just like a sort of a, it's rotten at essence, but there's sort of like a cardboard veneer of it that seems outwardly, you know, decent to, to the outside world. But it's, it's, it's fabricated in the same way that I don't think we can trust any of the official statistics provided where that's provided by the US government or any other government that I think increasingly people, people know how, to what extent government has been, um, let's just say, uh, not entirely trustworthy over the last few years in relation to a lot of different things. And I think increasingly people are reticent to trust government in relation to things like CPI or RPI data. So in relation back to the tech sector, I think the tech sector is already, already done, but you know, the, the dinosaur is dead, but it's, it, it's brain just hasn't recognized that fact yet. And, um, in, in your book that you wrote in 2015 called the war on cash, you said that recovery was fake and something worse than 2008 was to come. Indeed, we did have that with COVID, but was that the event you were thinking of, or are we still headed down the path or something worse? No, I think, I mean, I don't want to be a, a doomsayer because I'm, although I may not sound like it, I'm actually quite optimistic about the, the long-term future for, for humanity. But I think the, the, the thing that I continue to, to hark back to is, I think it's the book, um, too Big to Fail by Andrew Ross Sorkin, which I quoted right at the start of my own book, um, Investing Through the Looking Glass, back in 2016. And Sorkin had, I think he was a, maybe a columnist for the Wall Street Journal at the time, and he had amazing access to the people right at the center of the sort of Lehman crisis and the credit crisis generally. And he, he cites the example of Jamie Dimon having a conference call with the board of JP Morgan on the weekend, the Saturday morning of the weekend that Lehman Brothers failed back in September, 2008. And he said, basically that Diamond said the following things. He said, 
we are about to experience the most extraordinary period in US financial history. We should expect the Lehman Brothers to file, i.e. for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. We should expect Merrill Lynch to file. We should expect Morgan Stanley to file. Pause. We should expect Goldman Sachs to file. And then he says there was a sharp intake of breath on the other end of the line. No surprise, because he basically was forecasting or, or suggesting that we might be about to experience an existential extinction level event for Wall Street. Now, as we all know, that's not what happened. So what actually was did happen was that for whatever reason, Lehman was allowed to be thrown to the wolves. And then when the Fed realized what it had done, it then bailed out everybody else. But it wasn't really a bailout because all that happened was the load of Wall Street bankers got billions of dollars and the rest of Main Street just got stuffed. So that's the that's sort of way we came from. But that was like the sort of fork in the road um, moment. And as Yogi Berra once said, if you ever come to a fork in the road, take it. So they had a choice. They could have let the system as we know it fail. They chose not to do that. They chose to reflate and bail out and extend and pretend. And all that meant was that when the crisis did finally arrive, it was going to be worse. Now, COVID could have been that, but again, they papered over the cracks and, made, made, and they sort of kicked it, punted it into the future. Again, I think the crisis when it finally arrives is going to be a whopper. It's going to be bigger than anyone's ever seen before. Um, and exactly what precipitates it is unclear, but it's, I think it's probably going to start in the bond market. So I cannot see how you can have US Treasury yields go up as far as they've gone over the last two years, as quickly as they've gone up in the last two years without an enormous amount of collateral damage. So again, the, the analogy I'd make is that the ship has undoubtedly sunk, but we've yet to see many, if any of the passengers or, or what the left of the passengers float up to the surface. So I think this is just purely a, a, a timing issue now. It says, watch this space. But I find it impossible to believe you can't have the billions, if not trillions of damage incurred through treasury losses and the system just, just blithely sails on into the future. This is going to have extraordinary negative impacts on corporate borrowing costs, on household borrowings, you know, the, the, whole, the whole economy, not just in the US, but throughout the world. And the idea that we just sail through this seems to me to be completely, completely impossible to, to, to countenance. And how do you reconcile this with, say, with the green, green transition? Because it seems like with raising interest rates, we're having a lot of problems with, say, wind and solar projects right now. They're becoming uneconomically feasible. Um, they seem not to survive in the NERP environment. And so how do you see this going as far as the commodity sector is concerned, given that we have this green transition, given that we have um, you know, or on paper, we have a huge need for industrial metals um, and things of that nature uh, to make this transition. So how, how does that, how does that square? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we okay. don't have a dog in the fight for the, for the green transition as described. Um, I think partly because certainly my own personal view is that the green transition is complete bullshit. Um, it doesn't stack up economically, it doesn't stack up morally, it doesn't stack up in any conceivable way. It's a bit like ESG or DEI. It's a fad that, that many fund managers have happily clung to because it's a way of selling funds. But I don't think it has any economic real existence, any real substance. Now, from our perspective, all we're trying to do is trying to carry our client's precious capital forward into the future with as little damage as possible. And the same for our own portfolios, and et cetera, et cetera. So to an extent, for us, it doesn't really matter because the world will need industrial metals, whether or not those metals are ultimately being dedicated to the green transition or simply the, the rest of the economy as is. But I think the, the, the heartening development of the last few months for us has been that a lot of this green nonsense has, has started to disintegrate because it can't, like any battle plan, it can't survive first contact with the enemy. And now as the, the borrowing costs have gone up so astronomically on a relative and absolute basis, the idea that you can somehow mysteriously uh, replace the installed hydrocarbon base of the world and the installed hydrocarbon infrastructure of the world with basically windmills uh, is being revealed for the nonsense that it always was. So we don't have a, a foot in the green camp per se. We're just quite comfortable having exposure to things like, which in, would include industrial metals like silver, because you can't make an iPhone without silver, for example. You can't make an electric car without silver uh, as the most conductive metal. 
Um, so whatever happens to the green transition, as as said, uh, it, it, we're, we're kind of sitting on the fence. We're, we're a bit like, you know, for us, the, the commodity sector is a bit like, you know, the bit like being an arms dealer, the extent that as long as people are buying weapons, it doesn't really matter who wins the war. Well, that makes sense. And I agree about ESG, but <laughs> I've said that a lot. So we'll, we'll, we'll move back to Michael still having problems. I don't know if he's going to be able to, uh, to, uh, get back up here. So it might just be you two, but it'll be great. Um, so we'll move over to, uh, back over to Gub. Uh, wanted to get your thoughts on, um, the Canadian housing sector, right? It's been a bubble. It's been a bubble for ever. Everybody keeps talking about it. Is there an end in sight? And, you know, if that happens, is will there be a contagion in the U.S. or in the two entirely separate different markets, in your opinion? Oh, great question. I have wanted to back up a little bit on something that Tim had touched on and your question about technology. Uh, one thing that I think a lot of people have to remember is the passive complex is now pushing 27 cents of every dollar into the Magnificent Seven. And that's just the flaw of passive. And that will start to manifest itself as soon as we get job losses and those flows reverse. Uh, I think the market from today going forward is going to be significantly more volatile and people are just going to have to uh, to see that. And uh, even when companies like Vanguard rebalance, they can drop the market by 10% uh, out of the blue. And that's happened a couple of times. If you go back and you take a look at, at when Vanguard um, rebalances every five years, the next one's coming up August, 2025, they drop the market by 10%. So that passive thing is, is a massive uh, influence on stocks. Um, and I do agree with Tim that, uh, you know, the the, the governments and the central banks are basically just trying to conflate the level of the stock market with the health of the economy and trying to snooker people into thinking that things are better than they are. Um, with regards to housing in Canada, the U.S., everywhere, um, it's, uh, you know, it, for Canada and specifically British Columbia, where I am, um, it's been a massive problem and a big, uh, big source of debate. Um, I think we're starting to see now because of the uh, incredible work by Sam Cooper that there is an astronomical amount of uh, money laundering going on in Canada. And a lot of that money is getting poured deeply into uh, real estate, um, specifically uh, for Canada and for BC. Um, it's Chinese uh, illicit funds. And there are hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars of, of uh, assets just being bought up and they're basically just concrete money market funds. So the big question and the big thing that I have is, uh, you know, with the Chinese economy eroding, there is a potential where they get into their Minsky moment and uh, have to start blowing off those condos and homes to raise money in order to put out the fires at home. And that could be a real problem because the level of income needed to buy a home versus the price of homes suggests massive losses. Whether that happens or not, it's hard to say. Uh, the Canadian government uh, has decided to look the other way uh, with regards to the money, la money laundering issue because it's uh, uh, real estate is really the only thing keeping the Canadian economy afloat uh, through banking and, and legal and, you know, house assessments, real estate agents, all that kind of stuff. It's really the only thing that's been going on in Canada for a long time. Um, and something has to break. Uh, or we just get into a situation where we become a nation of renters and owners, and that's part of the old, uh, you know, you'll own nothing and be happy. <laughs> well, I don't know if that, if that works, but it, it's certainly a big issue right now. Um, I'm hopeful that we get a little bit of a correction in this uh, upcoming recession uh, to give some people some relief, but it's, it's hard to say. It just depends on when, when we decide to address that illicit fun thing. And um, let's talk a little bit about a lot of people have been talking about the 60, 60, 40 portfolio and it's dead. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, the, the 60, 40 portfolio, um, which is sort of the standard has had a, a rough couple of years. Um, I think that, that it will sort itself out. Um, the idea that, um, you know, the pe people who have been uh, quite conservative have been punished, uh, and that runs contrary to history. So, you know, if the stock market uh, is risky, you you should earn a, a strong rate of return. 
If it's not risky, uh, which everybody seems to think it is, you know, everybody, every broker I've ever seen has those index charts and says over the long term stocks always outperform. Um, but there's an asterisk there because, you know, the Chinese or sorry, the, uh, the Japanese market, the Nikkei hasn't been up since 1989. So, uh, th there are some, some shenanigans on that side. So I think that, that, uh, you know, the 60, 40 portfolio still has, has value, um, you know, uh, people who are in their seventies and eighties probably shouldn't have a hundred percent stock portfolios. And yet they have, a lot of people have, and, and, uh, have been rewarded handsomely. We need to introduce a risk back into the scenario. And, uh, we've had a uh, central bank intervention for so long now, um, and this whole buy the dip mentality. And that's why people are still, uh, uh, taking a look and, and, uh, some work has been done on this where before you go to the interventionist fed model, which is pre 87. Uh, the markets did not do well entering into recessions and post interventionist fed, uh, the market tends to do quite well until the break of the recession. And that's just a function of the market cottoning onto the idea that the fed is going to defend it as long as possible. So I think that the 60, 40 portfolio still has value. Um, it's just going to take some time. And, you know, I, I do think that there's a pretty nice, uh, opportunity in some bonds here. Um, I don't know. Uh, as much as I love bonds, I don't know whether I will be able to buy bonds after this last recession. It will depend on what the policy response is here. Because if, if, if the U.S. goes gangbusters and, and throws another X trillion dollars at the situation when this recession hits, um, then at some point in time, that debt is going to become an issue. Um, I think this is probably the last kick at the long, uh, at the long bond trade that uh, I've loved. Anytime there's an approaching recession, you buy long bonds and you make out like a, a bandit. So. I think this might be the last one, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I'm still a big fan of the 60-40 for sure. Excellent. Thank you. And then um, I wanted to talk about um, your thoughts on the U.S. labor market and why it remains so resilient. Uh, you know, I would think that in Canada, you know, you have such an influx of uh, immigrants that that kind of, uh, that kind of, uh, helps your labor market up there in Canada. But, um, what do you think about the U S labor market? Are you asking me or Tim? You. <laughs> that, that, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the labor market, it's, it's a lagging indicator, right? So everybody's waiting for jobs to, to peel off, but that's, that happens at the end. That doesn't, that doesn't happen at the beginning of a slowdown. So, um, I think, uh, interestingly, there, there seems to be some, some sort of weird stuff going on in the, in the, the jobs market, because you're, you're hearing of, uh, layoffs that haven't really showed up yet. Uh, um, you're hearing about a tight market and yet, um, you know, there's lots of people walking around that can't find jobs. Um, so I think there's some labor hoarding going on. I think that, uh, you know, uh, I watch, uh, Eric Basmajian's, uh, economic reports, um, and he does a lot of work on the, uh, construction side of things. And right now, uh, residential construction is an absolutely huge component of, of jobs and it hasn't rolled over as of yet. Um, there's still some momentum in the housing market. Um, but as soon as that rolls over, you're going to see the crack. So I, I think that, that. You know, it's still a little early for the jobs to start rolling over because that's the lagging part of the, in, of, of, uh, the indicators. Um, but I do think that, that it will roll over, but somewhere, uh, you know, um, with the COVID situation, we lost a few million workers. I don't know where they went. They're not showing up anywhere, but they're just, they're just plain old gone. Um, and, uh, I think because of that challenge there, uh, the, the companies that do have people employed now are really fighting as hard as they can to keep people employed for as long as possible. And that's why you're seeing companies report to uh, busted profit margins. They're just getting annihilated because they should be laying off people, but they're not. They're holding on to them for as long as possible to try and wait for this, quote, no landing uh, to, to manifest itself. And it's not. So I think you're going to start to see uh, companies give in here and start laying off people uh, left, right, and center. And you're already starting to see uh, reports of that. Excellent. Thank you. And then Tim, did you have any comments on that before I get into some more questions for you? It's just one thing I'd, I'd like to come back to on, on something that Gub said, which I think is really interesting. It's the point about passive investing 
and to an extent the 60-40 portfolio, which as we know has sort of worked tolerably well for probably the best part of several decades. The whole business of indexation is one that I find intriguing and a little bit, a little bit disappointing to the extent that it kind of presumes that there's, there's almost an implicit assumption that markets always go up pretty much every year. And th we know that, for example, I think there's a book, I think it's called something like the Triumph of the Optimist, which is a long-term study of the, the best performing stock markets over the 20th century. And the reality is that the whole stocks for the long run thesis comes from basically the Anglo-Saxon stock markets, namely the UK and particularly the US, because the US has been a long-term survivor. But that's that ignores the fact there have been other markets that closed and never reopened, for example, in a place like China or say Nazi Germany uh, or Russia. So the, the whole 60-40 thing in indexation, I think is, is a fascinating topic. And let's go back to the States. So the, I think I'm correct in the, in these figures that it, after 1929 and the, uh, the infamous Wall Street crash, I don't think the Dow Jones, which is admittedly a fairly narrow index, but I don't think the Dow Jones caught up with its 1929 level until 1954. So if you came into the market at the wrong time or were unlucky in your timing or were unlucky in your asset allocation, you basically for your entire life or your entire investment life, you basically, it was appalling. It was a bit like, say, Gub also highlighted the, the example of Japan. And Japan is a market that we find fascinating. The reason I, I find it intriguing is because firstly, um, as, as, he, as Gub correctly points out, Japan basically went nowhere or south for, uh, again, another 25 years, but it is starting to look a little bit healthier now. Japan is fascinating for a number of reasons. One of them is that as far as I'm aware, the cumulative loss of wealth suffered by Japan Inc. between the corporate sector and the household sector from that 89 peak equated to not one, but two American Great Depressions. So in other words, the Japanese were not just unfortunate, they were doubly or trebly unfortunate in terms of just how much their society suffered. And yet none of that colossal loss of wealth and loss of value in capital terms ever equated to social tension. So although they had you know, huge losses in terms of GDP and in terms of market cap valuation, et cetera, et cetera, there was never any writing on the streets. Japan remained a very orderly society. So I'm merely flagging the possibility that if and when we get a, a loss of value that, of that magnitude closer to home, our societies are not as stoic as Japan's. So it's going to be a completely different environment. And I cite Japan for the second reason, which is that they've been fighting deflation for most of that period. And they've only arguably just come out of that, that deflationary trap. So it shows what happens when you have a colossal banking sector bust and a property bust. It takes an awful long time to recover. And government tries to step in, but invariably makes the problem worse because government intervention always does that. And the reason I mentioned Japan is in the context of China, because we, we don't have any skin in the, in the China game, A, for ethical reasons, and B, for valuation reasons, because and C, for corporate governance reasons. But the intriguing thing about China is there's this expression that China gets old before it ever gets rich. And I have no problem, no animus against the people of China. I've got a huge animus against the Chinese Communist Party, for probably obvious reasons, but none against the people of China. But it may yet be that they never get to where Japan got to in the 80s because their, their demographics just don't work anymore. And also they have a, a, a sort of corporate regime which can best be described as somewhat flawed. So it, it's just intriguing to us that Japan, having wrestled with deflation for something like 25 years, is finally coming out of that morass just at the very time that the exact opposite seems to be happening in China. So I just find that sort of passing of the baton, if you like, just really, really intriguing. Well, and then since you brought up China, uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, this big thing that everybody seems to be talking about on Twitter, especially on ZinTwit, is, um, you know, China selling U.S. treasuries. So, it, you know, is this something we need to be worried about? What does it really mean? And is this money going, you know, somewhere else? Does it mean they're short dollars? I, I, I defer to Gub on the, the whole dollar milkshake type thesis and, and the, the shortage or, or lack thereof of dollars sloshing around the system. But I think the concern about China di disinvesting its portfolio of treasuries is an absolutely valid one. And there's a geopolitical point to this, which I think bears repetition, which is, to the best of my knowledge, the, during the, the Second World War, the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, the so-called central bank, the central banks, 
never dared to interfere with either Nazi Germany's foreign reserves. So they always respected the intellectual property rights of, of Germany's national um, asset base held abroad. Whereas we went far into the um, Ukraine situation when the Biden administration basically arbitrarily seized Russia's foreign reserves. And this is, of course, a nuclear power. All I'm, all I'm floating as an idea is that the, 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 the behavior of the US and maybe NATO and sort of the West more generally in relation to Russia, but particularly in relation to the Biden regime, may prove to be the most catastrophic self-inflicted disaster in the history of geopolitics. Because by basically sanctioning Russia, uh, which is a not trivial you know, geopolitical player, um, it's probably not that, that, that important at an economic level, but it's hugely significant, of course, as geopolitical power. Then in, doing, in, 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 in taking that action, it has deliberately or inadvertently, I suspect inadvertently, pushed Russia even closer into orbit around the new power, which is the ascending China. It's solidified a block against U.S. interests, namely the sort of the, the, the BRICS slash global south, the unaligned, so-called unaligned countries. And all of those countries, anyone that considers themselves unaligned, so let's say the, the Anglo-Saxon uh, Western um, system, all of those countries are going to be somewhat more reticent about holding treasuries. Now. So it's not just China we have to worry about, it's half the rest of the world. And that's not trivial because as far as I'm aware, the so-called emerging markets of the world now account for more GDP than the so-called developed markets. So the entire tectonic plates of global finance are literally shifting before our eyes as we speak. Gam, did you have uh, did, uh, anything to add in, about, add to happen about China selling tre treasuries? Or I can't speak today. Um, I only that I'm aware that, you know, a lot of people are concerned that they've been disinvesting and I would expect that to continue. Again, you know, it's the same issue about trust that no one can necessarily take the Chinese data at face value because we, there's a lot of people that suspect that China has been hugely under-reporting its purchases of, of gold bullion over the last, you know, decade. So there's all kinds of things happening behind the scenes and it's probably very few people actually really know the reality. So there's a lot of the sort of fog of war to these suppositions and fears and concerns. But... What I'm saying is the way the U.S. is behaving, it shouldn't expect anybody outside America to own its bloody debt. That would be a problem. And Gub, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that, that the, the, the decline of the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency is underway. Um, I don't know how imminent it is because I just don't. I, I can't see uh, an alternative. And, and uh, you know, bear in mind, um, like back in 93, the U.S. national debt was $4.4 trillion. We're at 32, 33 trillion now. Um, and yet REITs are still sitting at, you know, the 10 years at four, uh, 452. So um, I think uh, when all hell breaks loose, um, people who are worried about reserve currencies and, and uh, the U.S. dollar and stuff like that will run happily into the U.S. dollar. And, and um, as Tim mentioned at the beginning, it's a liquidity thing. And I, I think that liquidity is, is going to be uh, one of the most important assets uh, going. So, yeah, it, it, you know, we are well on our way to losing that, or, or the U.S. is well on its way to losing that reserve currency because it's pissing off so many of its trading partners. Um, and that process takes a long time. So it doesn't just happen overnight. Um, and it, it will have an impact. But I think that, you know, in the very near term, as we approach this, the resolution of this uh, economic decline, um, I think there's still uh, a bit of hope for the U.S. dollar. What happens again? What happens after this? Um, who knows? But for now, it's OK. But yeah, we're certainly well on our way. Thanks. And then back to uh, Tim, uh, I want to talk about emerging markets a little bit. Well, central banks are you know, raising rates everywhere, obviously. We're kind of at a pause, but you know we've seen some deep losses in emerging market stocks and bonds. So is there a danger here for uh, contagion risks? I think it's probably always a, a danger of contagion because we know how interlinked, I mean, the Lehman Brothers collapse on our rate showed us just how interlinked markets are and how how quick global capital is to move when it starts to get freaked out by development. So there's always risks, but I mean, we, we, we tend as a, as a firm to make our own investments predominantly concentrated and focused in uh, G7 markets. A, because we're, we're that much closer to them culturally and B, because we think we can 
attach slightly more trust to corporate governance than we can in, say, some of the developed world. This, we, we met a, a Hong Kong-based manager a few years ago, and he said that if there are, let's say, 1.3 billion in people in China, then you can, it's a fairly safe assumption that he said billion of them are crooks. Um, so there's, there's a whole different set of co sort of corporate governance issues in emerging markets relative to the so-called developed ones. But uh, all that strikes me about the, this, this, I would say, unique, uniquely challenging global environment is that it surely argues for more diversification than ever previously was the case. And as I said earlier, to my knowledge, the, there is now the sort of developed world has, has, kept, has caught up with the sort of the GDP expansion of the developed world. So they're much more level on a level playing field now. So then it comes down to valuation. Um, I just s submit that whether you're buying individual indices or whether you're buying ind indices or whether you're buying individual stocks, um, the, the, the absolutely crucial thing is, is valuation. So that the two metrics that matter to us more than any, any other in relation to stock selection are firstly, um, we want meaningful cash flow generation by the companies we invest in. Um, because we want jam today and not jam tomorrow because there's, there's too much risk attached to the, the possible rather than the certain. And the second, which brings us way back, all the way back to sort of 180 degrees to the, the debt situation is we don't really feel comfortable owning companies that have meaningful debt on their balance sheet. We'd much rather have companies that have little or no attendant debt. And so whether it's a decision between emerging or uh, developed comes down really to the, the, the debt and, and cash dynamics of the individual companies uh, rather than, let's say, the Ge geography where they happen to be based. Does that ultimately make hard assets more attractive at this point? Well, by almost by default, it does. Um, so as I say, the, from the, the analysis that we've done, uh, it seems to us that there is a huge anomaly and a huge opportunity in the world of what we term real assets, namely the world of precious metals and commodities, uh, just generally in relation to say the listed stocks that derive their income from the production of those um, commodities. And it seems to me not unfair to assume, to make the comparison between the environment we're now in, multiple levels at cultural ones, social ones, economic ones, geopolitical ones, to the 1970s. So I was, a, I was only a kid in the, in the 1970s when the OPEC sort of oil shocks occurred and Nixon took the dollar off gold and all these things happened. And we had a sort of a very inflationary or stagflationary decade. But it seems to me that for any number of reasons, the 70s is still a, 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 a reasonable uh, historical analog for what we're living through now. The difference being this time around that the debt predicament is so much more is so much more intense now than it was back in the seventies. And bearing in mind, in nineteen seventy six, the UK itself had to go cap in hand to the IMF for an emergency loan. Um, this time, there are going to be so many countries queuing up to the IMF. We're going to need some kind of super terrestrial force to bail them all out. So that's the reason why for us, we we simply we don't have we don't share Gubbs necessarily in enthusiasm for debt. We don't hold any debt at all. We don't have, hold any bond exposure at all. We'd much rather own, as I said, at the, maybe at the top of the show, we'd much rather own trend following funds. We're a small firm though, so we've got that latitude. But if you're a giant player, I suppose in some respects you have to own debt. But from our perspective, because we're a boutique, we can comfortably get away with going the road less traveled. But I think, again, as per the 60-40 thing, if, you, if, you, if there aren't compelling reasons to own something, then don't, don't own it. And I think Basically, at the end of a 5,000-year debt super cycle, there are still times when you really don't want to own interest rate-sensitive or inflation-sensitive assets. Right now is, is undoubtedly, in our view, one of those times. Excellent. Thank you. And, uh, Gub, what are your thoughts on BRICS? Since everybody seems to be talking about this, is this, you know, is this a sort of a new multipolar alliance that will, uh, you know, affect, ultimately affect investments. That was for you, Logan. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think that's all part and parcel of the, uh, of the transition of the U.S. sort of uh, losing its world reserve status. You, you, you get partnerships and you get alliances um that try and build something that can compete against the current system and that's that's just part and parcel one i don't know how long it'll take um to do and you know my my sense is that you know all, all i have uh on my radar screen right now is is the next sort of year um uh so the the brick situation is going to play out uh and take a lot longer than that to to sort of uh, come to its full 
uh, evolution. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, if this market pukes by 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent or something like that, suddenly uh, people are going to have a lot less problems holding U.S. Mm-hmm. U.S. dollars and U.S. debt or debt in general, just because there's that safety. Um, it's just a relative thing. But we, you know, this this decline in the market has been reasonably uh, calm. Um, but you know, if we get, if we get a crack or something really starts to break, then that's when, uh, people start to, to rip and, and look for safety and, and stuff like that. And, and like I said, uh, you know, I agree with Tim that, that bonds over the long, long term, probably not great, but I think in this six months, uh, sort of setup, I think that it's going to be an okay, uh, situation, you know, retail is a little different because we have to hold money aside for, for people to, to live and retire on and stuff like that. So bonds do play a a scenario there. But again, I'm really concerned about what, what's going to happen, what the response is going to be at the end of this or at the beginning of this recession and, and, uh, how they respond, whether they just decide to, to swamp the, the economy with more money and more debt. Um, you know, do they do QE again, even though it doesn't work? Like like it's a lot of it is going to depend on, on how, um, central banks and the governments respond to, to what's coming up. Excellent. And we're coming up on the hour, so it's the final round, and it's the same question for both of you. We'll start with Tim. You can either talk about something that you wanted to talk about that we did not cover today, and or what should we as investors particularly be keeping our eye on over the next 12 to 24 months, let's say? Um, In terms of things that I'd like to talk about, I'm quite looking forward to the release of the new Ridley Scott film, Napoleon. I'm a big fan of Joachim Phoenix. Um, but from a market's perspective, um, we'd really just reiterate the same points we've been making before, namely that without wishing to sound like a sort of a, doom, a perpetual doom scroller, that I think we are living through a unique, almost unique period in history where a lot of, at the end of these super cycles, a debt super cycle, an interest rate super cycle, you know, just going on the basis of what's worked historically isn't going isn't gonna to hold up any longer. So what I guess I'm saying is, what we our watch would probably be we believe in mean reversion, but over a sort of a much longer term basis. So, if one expects say interest rates to go a little bit higher than they already have got, and they've already got a comfortably high, if you were if your if your base if your base rate was zero two years ago, then you know there's still some, there's still there's still some pain to to be uh, to be experienced. So, the the three things that I would recommend as a sort of generic type asset glass exposure would be the same things that we try to invest in on behalf of our clients, namely very much defensive value stocks. So that if the market does puke, hopefully we, we don't go down much worse than the market, but then we have a better chance of recovering when the market recovers. But the two, the two standouts for us would be basically uncorrelated assets. That is to say, once again, CTAs, systemic, uh, systematic, excuse me, trend following funds, um, particularly those run by seasoned managers, because they can make money in down markets as well as up ones, which is encouraging. And they also have exposure to commodities, which most traditional managers do not. And then again, just to sort of bang the drum on the real asset thing, which is, I think the, the, the rally potentially to come in gold and silver and possibly also Bitcoin, which we haven't really dipped our toe into yet, but we, we may do in the future, the rally to come prospectively in, in the precious metals specifically could be, prove to be a religious experience for those people who find themselves short. Excellent. Thank you. And Bob, the same question. You can talk about something that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to cover yet and or what should we as investors be looking at over the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the next 12 to 24 months are going to be pretty exciting. Uh, from an investment standpoint, um, I would encourage everybody to just continue to stick to the models. You know, uh, everybody looks at fond curves, inver- uh, inverting and try, uh, try to figure out the messages there. The message is that there's a warning, uh, bond curves don't invert, uh, by mistake. Um, they reflect what's going on in, in the underlying economy. And, you know, there's this great quote that, uh, investment markets are made up of math and psychology. The math uh, deals with PE ratios and valuations and and things like that. And the psychology is everything that you do to try and talk yourself out of believing the <laughs> the math. And the math right now is not great. So, um, you know, I, I continue to, to lean more towards the defensive side. 
Um, I think that, uh, you know, the stock market is, is trying to seduce and, and uh, influence people away from being defensive by ignoring the, the signals. And this is, this is something that has happened time and time and time again. And it's, uh, again, why I said that uh, recessions tend to be so painful because uh, uh, people tend to, to ignore the signals. So I'm sticking to the models, which are suggesting right now to stay defensive um, and then just keep that cash uh, and, and uh, keep your capital uh, drive for opportunities that are going to present themselves uh, after all of this uh, clears through, um, you know, and and just just keep at it. All right, thank you. So defensive is the word for the day. And with that, I want to thank both of our guests for taking the time out of their schedules today. We really appreciate it. I appreciate it. I know the audience appreciates it. Please follow these uh, gentlemen. They've got a uh, wealth of knowledge between them. Also follow Place Your Trades to see what else we had going on over there. And with that, uh, we wish everybody a great afternoon. Again, thank you for spending an hour with us and we will see you next Wednesday.